Hi, my name is Alex Guns. I'm the fund manager of the Heptagon Future Trends Equity Fund, and I'm here today to talk to you all about the opportunities within decentralized finance. Decentralized finance is very, very simply the opposite to centralized finance. Centralized finance is the traditional or current system we have where uh, central platforms and intermediaries effectively orchestrate financial transactions. The whole idea behind decentralized finance is basically for users to take back control. And the way in which they take back control is by using public blockchain solutions. These are decentralized and they effectively allow users to conduct all manner of financial transactions across the spectrum, everything from trading and investment through to credit and savings. Decentralized finance or DeFi as many people refer to it, also sits very, very importantly within this whole uh, new world, if you will, of Web 3.0. If Web 1.0 was static HTML pages, Web 2.0 was about platforms with which we've all become very familiar. Web 3.0 is all about decentralization and effective democratization of the internet. I think the problems of the existing financial system have been evident for some time. They were really perhaps brought to the fore by the credit crisis in 2008. It was really then revealed the sort of failings of financial institutions to a certain extent, the fact that they were, the system didn't perhaps work when fully stressed, uh, there were certain inequalities, and really even uh, fast forwarding to today, it's abundantly obvious to many people and many businesses that there are effectively hidden costs everywhere within the system. And really the, these costs are a function of centralization and decentralization is really trying to reduce these costs. So when we think about costs, uh, many users will clearly be familiar, many consumers will clearly be familiar with the idea that every time they trade, every time they exchange money, foreign currency, there are costs attached to that. Every single retailer, again, when they're processing a credit card transaction, there will be costs attached to that. The premise behind DeFi is really to try and reduce those costs and to increase efficiency. As we suggested when answering the last question, really the benefits in one sentence can be described as effectively reduced costs and increased efficiency. When we think about how this is achieved and how and what are the key building blocks, if you will, of the DeFi system, you can see very, very clearly the benefits and the contrast to the centralized system. So number one, the system is open and permissionless. What that effectively means is that anyone who has an internet connection anywhere in the world can participate in decentralized finance. The traditional centralized model, uh, if you wanted to open a bank account or do something similar, you'd probably need some form of identification like a passport. The second uh, attraction is that the system is autonomous and self-sustaining. In other words, the foundations upon which DeFi operates are open source code, means effectively where anyone can edit this code, anyone can add to this code over time. And that takes us nicely onto the third and final point, which is this whole idea of the system being modular and compostable. In other words, there are clear foundations, you add building blocks to it, the ability to add a building block quickly to introduce a new service is substantially faster than in the traditional centralized world of doing things. The most tangible examples of the potential for DeFi can really be considered as Bitcoin and Ethereum. These are digital currencies. Bitcoin came th first in 2008, Ethereum followed in 2013. Ethereum was really an enhancement to Bitcoin in the sense that Ethereum is a platform, a set of protocols. Ether is in fact the native currency with which you transact on Ethereum protocols. Together, uh, when you look at Ethereum and Bitcoin or the um, digital currency uh, market as a whole, you're looking at a value today of $2 trillion. That's absolutely immense. And pe at peak, in fact, it was $3 trillion. So when you think about what digital currencies do, they basically allow you to transact. And really, this takes you down to the next level. Uh, you think of any potential financial asset where transactions can occur. This could be within the credit space. It could be within the investing space. 
it could be within the trading space. When you actually think about what you might potentially want to do with a digital currency, this is where we get on to NFTs. An NFT, for those who are unfamiliar, is a non-fungible token. Think of it like this, it's effectively a digitally watermarked uh, asset. So just like any banknote in the real world will have a unique number, a unique identifier, any digital asset will have a similar unique identifier. And this is great if you want to create something of value like an artwork. NFT has probably hit the headlines in, um, in, in 2021 when the artist Beeple sold a digital artwork at Christie's for a record sum of $69 million. Uh, since then, the market's really exploded in many ways. Uh, the figure that comes to mind is that in 2021, as a total, you saw about $17 billion of NFTs traded. That's up 200 times relative to the level of the year prior. Given the huge growth in the market, um, it's inevitable that governments and regulators have to respond. I guess there are really two perspectives through which to consider this. Uh, number one would be just think about the sheer size of digital currencies. At peak, they were probably $3 trillion in value. Uh, currently, it's about $2 trillion, but still clearly a very sizable sum. That basically means that, number one, uh, central banks, governments, regulators are trying to think about where digital currencies fit into their own financial ecosystems. Uh, you've already got 14 central banks around the world apparently uh, piloting um, digital currencies today. Uh, when you look at surveys or studies, about 80% of all central banks globally say they are considering uh, launching a digital currency at the moment. So that's great, that's exciting. But number two, or the second part of the discussion is that as soon as a market becomes this significant, you have to start thinking about regulation. And this is really where some of the problems, I think, with DeFi become evident, because clearly the way the financial system works today, even if we know it has flaws, is that it's been built up over hundreds of years. And clearly, if there are problems, there are regulatory nets, there are regulatory solutions with which to deal uh, with these problems. So we have to think about how contracts in a uh, DeFi world actually get honored. Is there legal recourse here? Uh, things that in many ways people take for granted, like know your customer, anti-money laundering, these meet, need to be considered in a new DeFi world as well. So regulators clearly need to get to work. There are three other things I'd just call out from a practical point of view that really need, to my mind, to be considered. Uh, the first is the whole idea behind DeFi is that it is, as we said, giving users control again. It's decentralized, it's permissionless. So suddenly you have an event like um, what's happening in Russia and Ukraine at present, and certain Russian IP addresses, uh, which are linked to Bitcoin accounts, are suddenly uh, sanctioned. That suggests that po politicians uh, or regulators will clearly continue to play a role, even in a more decentralized environment. Number two, and this is absolutely crucial, is this whole idea about scalability. Think about it like this, that today um, the Ethereum network can process something like up to 30 transactions a second. That might sound quite impressive, but then consider what Visa does as uh, probably the biggest financial transaction pipe in the world. They're doing 55,000 transactions a second. So the big debate, of course, is as um, DeFi uh, scales, can it actually handle a, a bigger volume of transaction? The final thing which I think everyone will be clearly concerned about is the issue of uh, security and fraud. Uh, the figure that springs to mind is that about $14 billion was lost to, um, to scams relating to DeFi uh, or to digital currencies last year. And clearly this needs to be addressed. Have no doubt it's a huge opportunity, even with some of the concerns we called out. And just to give a few figures for context, uh, and this is all contained within our note, about $30 billion went into venture capital relating to uh, blockchain and DeFi solutions last year. About $10 billion went into crypto and other related uh, venture funds last year. And about $3 billion went into uh, NFT projects. So you can clearly see there's a huge opportunity here. There's a lot of capital being put to work. 
I guess the, um, the best parallel we can think of is really trying to compare what's happening today in DeFi with what was happening with regard to the internet a generation ago. Everyone gets the potential, but the industry is still quite immature, and clearly they're going to be a number of losers as well as winners. When we try and think about it from a public equity point of view, there are a couple of dynamics at work here. Obviously, if you think about the big centralized um, platforms that have grown up today, both within the world of finance and within the world of consumer internet, the whole idea of decentralizing runs totally contrary to what they have achieved over the last few years or even decades. So the challenge is really almost like the incumbent's dilemma. How do you embrace this technology without it disrupting your business too much? And clearly we're seeing a number of different scenarios being explored at the moment. Within the sort of consumer internet side of things, probably Meta, the former Facebook, uh, Twitter, uh, are, are perhaps more advanced in their thinking than some other companies. Within the world of finance, probably PayPal to a certain extent, and the business called Block, uh, which was formerly Square, uh, are, are sort of leading the charge in terms of their thinking in this respect. But I think the key message really is it's still incredibly early days. Um, once the applications are built, have no doubt the users will come, but identifying winners today is certainly quite a bit harder. So. Uh, you've had the chance to hear our thoughts on decentralized finance. I hope everyone's found this interesting and illuminating. As we said, it's clearly an evolving subject. I would urge everyone to read the piece we've written. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out either to me or to your representative at Heptagon. Thank you very much.